tale on the Cuomo family dog last year. Uh, our next speaker is from the Massachusetts Working Families Party. Massachusetts? <laughs> Massachusetts. Being a different state. <laughs> <laughs> no breaks. <laughs> so let's cut him some slack, right? Uh, my friend uh, Rand Wilson uh, has been an activist in and organizer for probably more unions than everybody on this panel. Uh, Rand uh, started out in the OCAW. He's uh, worked for Massachusetts Jobs with Justice. He has been an organizer for the IOGWU, for the carpenters, for the service employees, for the Massachusetts Teachers Association, for the IBW, for CWA, and the AFL-CIO. Did I leave anybody out? That's good enough. Good enough, okay. Uh, in one of his uh, stints for uh, my union alma mater, the Communication Workers of America in 2006, uh, Brother Rand got a leave of absence from CWA and was actually able to run as a union-funded candidate for the position of Massachusetts State Auditor. Uh, he got 360,000 votes, 19% uh, of the vote, and this was tied into an effort that we undertook in Massachusetts in 2006, only after a close consultation with Rand's old professor, the late Howard Zinn, who uh, had given us a tutorial on the use of cross-endorsement and fusion to boost the influence of third parties uh, during the 19th century in Massachusetts. Uh, so in 2006, we undertook uh, both Rand's campaign to gain ballot status for the Working Families Party of Massachusetts, but also a referendum campaign to re-legalize fusion or cross-endorsement voting, which had been outlawed in Massachusetts and many other states in, as a right-wing reaction to the populist uh, era. And uh, we were not successful in re-legalizing fusion. We got about 36% of the vote uh, on that measure. And, uh, Ran ran as an auditor candidate at the same time to, to help us get ballot status. So he's going to tell us the rest of the story. And let's remember that he is from where? Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Very good introduction. Well, you're not wearing your Kevlar, so I... Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so my experience, uh, you know, really was uh, not that... <clears throat> Uh, not a very serious candidate for state auditor, but uh, uh, using my candidacy to you didn't try tell to tell the voters that. No, but but uh, I put ninety percent of my effort into trying to uh, campaign to change the election laws in Massachusetts that would allow uh, the cross endorsement or third party. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, fusion <coughs> option in, in, in the state. Uh, which was uh, legal in Massachusetts up to about 1911, I think, uh, when the state legislature uh, prohibited uh, cross-endorsement. And uh, so working with about, I don't know, I think it was about 25 different unions uh, and uh, the community group ACORN, a couple of other community-based organizations, uh, we set a goal of changing the election law. And once uh, with the idea that if we could change the election laws, we would establish a working families party. And it was a, a fascinating experience. I don't, I, I really had, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I just had a great time uh, being a labor backed candidate. And uh, most of my campaign as a statewide candidate was going to union halls. Uh, I didn't do too much door knocking. I did a lot of living room uh, little living room meetings and little living room kind of fundraisers with small groups uh, that were generally pulled together by union people that I had worked with over the years in one capacity or another for all that long list of unions that Steve recited. So uh, we, we used my candidacy to try and uh, win the ballot initiative. And, uh, you know, it didn't... Uh, we're, we were just not, we, we, had, we did raise quite a bit of money uh, for the ballot initiative, but not enough to, to really explain a complicated change uh, in the election law uh, so that voters would be enthusiastic about it and understand it. And when people don't understand something, they tend to vote against it. And of course, the newspapers and the Democratic Party in Massachusetts campaigned uh, kind of quietly against it. I mean, you know, the, sort of the 
behind the scenes thing was vote that down. And uh, that's really all it took from the establishment to, to defeat us. Um, my motivation, and I think the, the 20 or so unions that were in our coalition uh, that wanted to start something new, were really grew out of the frustration of being taken for granted, uh, which I think we heard from a couple of the panelists, uh, that our issues in a essentially a one-party state, Massachusetts is uh, overwhelmingly, you know, 90% Democrat legislature. And uh, it, it's, we have the fewest uh, competitive elections except for one southern state, I think uh, Mississippi or uh, uh, one other state has, you know, uh, less contested elections in Massachusetts. So here's this great liberal state and uh, often, you know, more often than, than every other state except for one, uh, races are not, not competitive. Right? There's no, nobody running against the, the incumbent. Uh, and that's just taken for granted. So it's a, we have a horrible uh, system. And yet, when Greens run against, uh, run for statewide office, they typically get about 6% uh, of the vote. They have almost no labor support. No sort of, uh, they get rank and file support. I vote Green. Uh, yeah, we, we vote green, but, we, but it was impossible to try to get labor unions to come around uh, uh, institutionally to come on board. And uh, so I think one of the things that, that our objective was, and what was so exciting, was to pull together this coalition of uh, Teamsters, SEIU, United Food and Commercial Workers, uh, uh, teachers, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other uh, mainstays of it. Uh, of the initiative, but groups like that, very, you know, established uh, uh, local and regional labor bodies uh, that really came around behind, hey, we don't want to be taken for granted. We need a way to, to enter into politics, but we don't want to get into uh, being the, the spoiler. And uh, I found that labor unions were obsessed with the issue of, of spoilerism. And they have a real obligation to, you know, politics matters. And they play politics to the, try to play politics to the benefit of their members as best they can. And they don't want to be, uh, uh, to sever that tie with uh, the Democratic Party. They're, they're, they rely on that too much and they see it as, as, as a meaningful way to, to get work, or to you know achieve objectives for their members, and yet there's a, this overall frustration that on the big on the big issues it's just lip service, and uh, you know experiencing labor's uh, decline, recognizing that we're basically fighting a a, 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 a class <coughs> war uh, with one hand behind our back uh, without having the, the uh, a political voice of our own for working people. So we tried to start the, the, uh, the, the Working Families Party, and we wanted to, to beat the issue of, uh, of the spoiler question by advancing the idea of, of uh, a cross-endorsement vote. Um, Green Party candidates, like I said, polled between 4 and 6% over the last, uh, some excellent candidates, too. I mean, they ran good races. They were in the debates. Uh, they were uh, very high profile, raised some money. But when it came to election time, everybody was like, I really like what she's saying, but I'm going to vote for the, the Dem because the, there's this evil Republican out there, and you know it could be close. And uh, uh, so people threw their votes. Uh, uh, they didn't vote their values. They didn't vote their, their conscience. They voted pragmatically. And uh, I suspect in Ohio, there's a hell of a lot more than 25,000 socialists voting. I bet there's a lot more than that, but people are reluctant to to cast their their vote. When I ran, we picked we carefully picked a race so that it would be non-competitive, and uh, in the sense that <coughs> there was no Republican running against uh, Joe Danucci, the state auditor, who was a four or five time incumbent uh, and a shoe in uh, to be reelected. So. I bet you out of the uh, 
19% of the vote that I got, at least 10% was an anti-Danucci vote uh, that probably came from Republicans who had no place to go. Sound familiar? <laughs> the Republicans had no place to go, so they, many of them voted for me just because anybody but Joe Danucci. And then the other percentage that I got was probably uh, earned uh, through the coalition of, of, uh, of unions that were talking of my candidacy and wanted to see uh, uh, our campaign get 3% of the vote that would qualify Working Families Party to be uh, on the ballot uh, in the next election. So I'll wrap up there. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, as uh, a couple of people mentioned, Howie mentioned, you know, a force of me to get out and just speak with uh, so many different rank and file members, general, uh, uh, get beyond the labor movement to talk to workers who were not necessarily in a union, but identified with uh, uh, working class issues and were excited about, you know, uh, hearing their values and their frustrations uh, articulated. Uh, so that was a great experience. I would do it again in a heartbeat, uh, but it seems like what, was, what I particularly enjoyed was the backing of so many labor organizations and the feeling of being part of that movement uh, 